To anyone who has a rudimentary understanding of the Bible, almost nothing could be more united than with the Lord Jesus Christ and his church, which is even referred to as the Bride of Christ. Many have even caused controversy over which organization in history has its roots far enough to have even been associated with Christ and the Apostles. This claim is based on ecclesiastical heritage, and this passing down of authority is referred to as apostolic succession. You will find these claims primarily within institutions like Catholicism and the Orthodox. Although they would like to claim that they have a direct connection to the past through a highly esteemed line of men dressed up in lawn robes, this is a claim based in pride and neglect for what the body of Christ truly is. Let's start to dissect the myth of apostolic succession, the one way that really matters, through the Bible. So let's get started with our first passage. Acts 20 verses 28 to 30. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Here we can see that Paul knew that grievous wolves would appear after his departure, and all of this happening right there in the first century. You can see the pride and esteem of these men where it says to draw away disciples after them. Some might even dare to say to call them church fathers. Oh, I don't know if I was supposed to say that. Uh-oh, that might offend some people. Eh, whatever. You can see this take shape in books like 1 Corinthians and Galatians, where in Galatians Paul wrote in chapter 1 verses 6 to 9, saying, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let's start our next point with another passage. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 3 to 6 For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. If you're going to claim that your organization goes back to Paul, Peter, or even the Apostle John, you've got another thing coming. Here, you can see that this doesn't matter, as it is God who is the head of the church and his word that we are to obey. Other denominations do the same thing, which shows the neglect to passages like Romans 2.11, where it says, For there is no respect of persons with God or even in the first half of Romans 3 verse 4, where it says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. Let's turn to the next passage. Mark 9 verses 38 to 41. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. 
But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Here you see John was quick to condemn a man casting out devils because he was not one of the disciples. And yet Jesus did not condemn this man. If someone is operating according to the word of God, he does not need to be attached to some sort of institution with hardly verifiable claims of origin. Paul demonstrates how in Philippians 1 verse 15 to 18, that there are even those who preach the gospel in contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. And yet his response in verse 18 is, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. If you really are a part of the church Christ founded, you would not need everyone to fall under your flag, as the message of the gospel according to the word of God is what really matters. Let's end off this segment with one last point, starting with a passage of scripture. James 1 verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. You don't need to go to an institution full of men dressed up in silly looking costumes from some sort of special, unattainable wisdom. Because God through his Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 even states that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In conclusion, this should make the point quite clear that as long as you have a King James Bible, can pray to your Holy Father, and can enjoy a fellowship of two or three, you have more than what you need. Being a part of some special man-made organization doesn't get a person saved, but being one of the members of the living body of Christ does.